So um, as a last speaker, I guess I should thank the organizers, both from the Hub and Boston people for this great event. So before I give an update on what's fairly self-explanatory, the transcriptome atlases of the cranial facial features we're creating, I'll just give a update of a background for the sutures. Okay, so in the in the vertebrate skull, the bones are separated by fibrous joints called sutures, as shown in this P0 micro CT image of the mouse. So, in the simplest definition for a suture, it consists of two subregions. You have the osteogenic fronts, where free osteoblasts will proliferate and differentiate into osteoblasts, where they then lay down the bone. And they're separated by suture mesenchyme, which, at least for postnatal ages, becomes the home for stem cells, as shown by Yang Chai's group and Wei Su's group recently. And during embryonic development, so the relationship between suture mesenchyme and osteogenic fronts is, I think, a little bit unclear at the moment. But, so what I just showed you was, there was the typical arrangement for a suture in the calvaria. So basically, it's sort of a, a thin, thin plates of bone and sutures in that sort of narrow plane of mesenchyme. Then these are stretched over the brain. But suture morphology varies quite strongly, so I can vary with this. Um, especially in the face. So here I'm showing you an E16.5 sagittal section through the mouse face. And the frontal nasal suture, for example, is typical of what I just showed you. You have rugs two representing the bones in green, or osteoblasts in green, separated by a thin layer of mesenchyme, indicated by BCL11B in red. But other sutures, such as the nasal premaxillary or the premaxillary maxillary on the top right, have a very broad end-to-end -end interface. And other sutures, such as the maxillary palatine, have a broad overlapping interface, where what you might think of as the osteogenic fronts, like if you're looking at this bone, which is the narrow edge, edge of each bone, is actually only a small component of the entire bone mesenchyme interface. But in each of these sutures, the mesenchyme is readily identifiable by gene expression, such as BCL11B or other genes that we've been finding in our transcriptome analysis. So the proper function and formation or formation and function of the sutures relies on differential gene expression. Um, so for example, this can be, and if you mess with either the expression or the function of these genes, you end up with various craniofacial dysostoses, such as craniosynostosis frontonasal dysplasias, and mid-face hyperplasia. And this can be exemplified by FGF receptor 2 and twist 1 expression. So FGF receptor 2 is expressed in the osteogenic fronts, uh, the parietal bone and the, front, and the frontal bone, in this E16.5 mouse suture, the coronal suture. And if you have activating mutations of FGF receptor 2, FGF receptor 2 you get ossification of the mesenchyme and fusion of the coronal suture in In humans, in humans, such as in Apert syndrome, so here we have the open coronal suture that's uh, fused, and also in mouse models of the same of Apert syndrome, we have fusion of the suture by P0. Um, conversely, twist is expressed in the suture mesenchyme and the osteogenic fronts, where depending on its interaction with other protein partners, it'll either repress FGF receptor 2 in the mesenchyme, or it'll actually activate its expression in the osteogenic fronts. And so when you lose um, twist one expression, you end up with, again, ossification across the coronal suture mesenchyme. And this occurs in Sather Trotson syndrome in humans, where you lose the coronal suture. And again, in mouse models of twist one haploinsufficiency, this is reproduced. But our knowledge of gene expression in the sutures is actually fairly limited. And to understand normal suture um, function, let alone abnormal suture function in disease, we need like a comprehensive uh, knowledge of gene expression. So that's what the Transcription Atlas project aims to rectify. And we're building our atlases from 11 sutures, but we're doing it from multiple ages, wild type, and craniosynostosis genotypes. So um, the sutures are summarized up here. There's various cranial sutures um, shown either in side view or in the top view, such as the frontal, the sagittal, the coronal, and the and various facial or palatal sutures, um, including the intranasal and then intramaxillary, intermaxillary, et cetera. 
And these futures also vary in ways that may be may involve differential gene expression, such as whether they're cranial or facial, sorry. Um, often which involves whether they're derived from neural crest or from mesoderm or actually mixed lineages within the suture. Um, in some cases, the bones will be different. So in the case of, say, the coronal suture at the top here, in red and yellow, these are two separate bones that so might be expected to have differential or different gene expression within each bone. And also just the structure, whether they're end-to-end, -end, either broad or narrow, or overlapping sutures. So in its final form, the third set will consist of, at least for the wild type samples, that's 285 wild type expression profiles. So each box, say in the top left, represents one replicate of a suture and may have either two or three divisions, depending on whether it has one like, homologous pair of bones. So you know, the left or the right are basically the same bones, say the frontal. Or in the case of the coronal, they may have two separate bones and the suture doesn't kind. But each box is like a replicate, so we have five replicates of each sample for statistical robustness when you come to the analysis. Um, each row, as I said, is a suture, so there's 11 of those at two different ages. And for E14.5, we're including the coronal suture because it forms so early in development and actually fuses fairly early in the mouse screen. So also, Sorry, and so we're also doing two craniosynostosis mouse models to understand what happens during pathological fusion of sutures. So I've just briefly touched on these already. These are the Apert syndrome mouse activating F Jefferson 2 mutation and the twist one haploinsufficiency mu. And again, so summarizing what the total suture probe um, analysis will contain. For the Apert mouse, we're doing all the sutures that we did for the wild type. Um, the coronal is probably the typical suture that most people will think of, which fuses in craniosynostosis. But various others of the facial sutures also fuse 5P0, and some of these sutures, such as the frontal, are actually wider at birth. Various things are happening, some expected, some unexpected in these sutures. Also for the twist, we're including the two affected sutures, which is the coronal, which fuses, and the frontal, which is a little bit wider at birth. So in total, we'll end up with about 635 unique RNA safe data sets. And our approach is using laser capture, as illustrated from the top here. And basically we take frozen sections of these mice at the appropriate ages. Um, the sections in a plane that's most appropriate for the suture that we're interested in dissecting. And so in the case of the frontal, we're dissecting out the ostigen of the suture mesenchyme as one population. And in this case, because the frontal bones are equivalent, um, unless there's enough right difference which we're assuming there is a data set they're taking out as one separate population. So if the bones are homologous, you end up with two different RNA-seq data sets for suture. And if the bones are non-homologous, we have three RNA-seq data sets. Um, basic flow through of what we do. So again, basic after micro dissection, the five replicates. So that's five individual mice. Um, RNA is a low input process. So we have one to 10 nanograms of RNA. Yeah, this is amplified, but RNA is suppressed. So we have basically total RNA, which includes, M includes mRNA and long non coding RNA. Um, standard aluminum high set 2500 sequencing. We're doing paired end reads of 100 nucleotides, so we can capture all kinds of splicing. And a depth of about 40 million read pairs, so we get comprehensive gene detection. So this is just an example of what we can get out of our RNA set data sets. So this is a differential expression analysis for the wild type frontal suture. It's showing you a heat map of genes differentially expressed between the osteogenic fronts and the mesenchyme. Genes that are of red indicates higher expression, blue indicates lower expression. And you can see from the heat the cluster analysis at the top that the osteogenic front samples separate very cleanly from the mesenchyme samples. But not only that, we can easily separate the two different ages of both the osteogenic fronts and the suture mesenchyme. Uh, just up on the right is, is an example of a browser track showing for one bone specific gene, in this case, in different binding salad protein, showing that in our five replicates we detected expression, but in the suture mesenchyme, you don't see its expression. Up here. And if you look at the genotology analysis, the 
the genes that are upregulated in the autogenic front. We see categories that we would expect to see, so yellow fold development, ossification, and the genes that make up this, uh, these categories are your typical runs to um, IBSP, um, osteocalcin, osteopont, etc. We also have proliferation markers, which we would expect that this proliferation is happening in the, in the osteogenic fronts. And there's some interesting categories such as sterile metabolism, which is interesting in that Indian hedgehog signaling is one of the genes where Indian hedgehog, patch one, and glue one are regulated in our osteogenic fronts. So it seems to be a point of Indian hedgehog signaling and cholesterol modification of the ligand. Indian hedgehog ligand is necessary for this hedgehog signaling. So this is just an overview of the samples or the data sets that we have in the space based repository at the moment. So we have four sutures in total frontal suture, coronal, intermasal, and premaxillary. Um, this represents the 18 individual sutures if you're taking into account the wild type versus either the aphid or the twist mutants and the two ages, E16.5 and E18.5. And you can see fairly clearly that you know, um, for these. This, this, and this, the suture mesenchyme and the osteogenic front population separate very cleanly. The same how the T or the V have two separate osteogenic front populations, the frontal and the primal, which is why it looks um, a little bit different to these two. So the mesenchyme is that third, and then you have the osteogenic front separating out, separating out on the other side. Um, another example of analysis that you can do with this data. So this is basically showing you differential expression of the variant across the edges and futures. So in this case, we've taken genes that are differentially expressed, and it's expressed as the ratio of expression between the osteogenic front and the mesenchyme, and it includes any gene that's differentially expressed in any one of these conditions, so three sutures or two ages, and then comparing its differential expression across all of those conditions. Um, and these yellow tracks down here give you an indication they correlate one to six to the one to six heat map columns. And they give you the um, p value for its different uh, significant expression. So basically, what this is telling you that for any given gene, its, its expression or its differential expression can vary both between ages and across different sequences. I just want to step back to this. So we've also done or performed validation of various genes from here, and I should have pointed out that there's a poster from Nalu, transcription analysis of frontal suture, prints in the first mouse models, that gives more details about them. Okay. And likewise, with this kind of data, um, Divya Kriti is presenting a poster which goes into further details of this. Um, likewise, we can do alternate slicing analysis. And again, I'm not going to go into strong detail. I just want to present an example of the periostin gene. And you can probably either look at the top or the bottom, either this browser track or the sashimi plot. But basically, we can detect in the suture mesenchyme, there's an absence of isoforms, or that, a decrease in isoforms containing exon 18 and exon 22. So basically, there's more exon skipping of exon 18 and 22. In the suture mesenchyme periosteum ice form. And again, Divya's poster has a fair bit of detail about this process in the data sets. Um, this is just one, but there are hundreds of genes that are detected that have differential expression. And finally, we can do network analysis. Basically, we have enough samples in, this, in the data sets to do this. We're basically just trying to see which genes are correlated in their expression whether they go up together, down together, or they're going in opposite directions, but in a way that their expression is tied. Um, and you can group these into various modules, et cetera, that have each one is annotated with its most, um, most significant gene ontology. Term. And I've just highlighted a few of the pathways that were of more of interest to us. So FDF is like the signaling, um, cell matrix, and then signaling over here. And so this is based on the wild type frontal suture mesenchyme. So in our quest to pull the sutures apart even further, we've been successful in getting a competitive revision for a single cell, single cell sequencing of the sutures. 
So the suture, the sutures have sub regions. So I talked about the two sub regions, osteogenic months and mesenchyme. But even within these, you get sub um, subpopulations of cells. And this has been known for, or obvious for, for a long time for osteogenic fronts, where as osteoblasts or pre osteoblasts proliferate and differentiate, they activate or they express different um, components of FHF receptor receptors. Um, starting with FHF receptor 2 and then progressing to FHF receptor 1 and then laying down the bone, etc. Um, you can see this in another example, again going back to bcl 11 b which is now shown in green in the suture mesenchyme or RUNX2 in red. And you can see that even though bcl 11 b is predominantly in the mesenchyme, you get these overlapping populations of cells at the osteogenic front. Um, the significance of which isn't particularly known. And even more interesting is the suture mesenchyme is, and you can see in the data that, or in the literature that there's some gene expression patterns which are only a sub-portion of the suture mesenchyme, um, but there's very little of this reported and very little is known in general about this. In this case, it's thrombus fondant, which is expressed in the sagittal and the frontal suture, but not, for example, in the coronal suture. So not only is it like a sub-region of the mesenchyme expressing this gene, but it's also gene spe um, suture specific. So there's heterogeneity of gene expression within the osteogenic fronts and in the suture me mesenchyme, but it's basically not defined in the literature. And it's something that's very difficult to do if you only can go by comparing two genes at time, say by um, double immunistic chemistry. And the significance of these popular subpopulations is also unclear. Uh, so the current transcriptome atlases, they provide deep sequencing of the osteogenic plants in the mesenchyme, but they necessarily homogenize any subpopulations within these two regions. With the single cell sequencing, our goal is to dis distinguish these subpopulations. And our target is uh, having a thousand cells per suture library at a depth of about 100,000 reads, which has been shown to be more than good enough to identify subpopulations in the literature. Okay. So the sutures that we're doing are uh, all wild type sutures, and they're the carbonyl sutures most on for cranial synostosis. Diseases. Um, these are the frontal, sagittal, coronal, ventral. We're doing it in the three ages, and in this figure on the right, I'm just showing you for the sagittal suture. Um, and I showed from a paper that just shows that there's different morphology at the three time periods that we're doing our experiments. So in 18.5, um, this is in terms of the older age in our atlases, and it's a time of actually formation of the suture, so not really definitive yet. At P10, this is a period of active skull expansion. So the sutures are devoted to expanding the skull. But also, interestingly, for the frontal suture, it's um, a period where this suture is about to fuse the thumb as part of normal development in the mouse and human. And at P28, basically, it's post expansion. So we might expect to see suture subpopulations related to just mature, mature suture maintenance or perhaps stem cell populations. Um, and we'll also be performing validation of differential gene expression that we discover. So the method that we're using is one of the latest droplet-based technologies. The experiment. And basically, you take your cell expression, which is now being compared by the projection of the strong sutures, and you mix it with the you know, um, barcode jobbies and reaction enzymes and oil. And basically, your cells with the reaction reagents can encapsulate it in oil droplets. Um, it's basically one cell per droplet, so one cell becomes one library during the library stage. And then you can take all these cells and sequence them together. And then, because you have like, unique identifying barcodes with it for each cell population, and then also for each transcript within the population. You can then sort the cells or differentiate them based on the differential genes. So in this figure on the left that shows you an example of your cell sitting in a drop or sitting next to um, one of these buildings, um, surrounded by reaction mixture and being encapsulated in oil. So I'd just like to show some preliminary results from this. Um, this is from the 18.5 console suture. This is about 500 cells. We can see that the osteoblast population is green and mesenchyme population 
and where it separates nicely from the very other population. Most of which are not avoided, so terms of not avoided linear derivatives, um, also some peri-site among here and some And if you look at the heat map, so we can find the genes that are differentiating these populations. Um, if you concentrate on anything that's pretty much dark red or orange, you can see that each population, in this case the octoblast and the mesenchyme, are nicely separated by the same cluster of different genes. Okay, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge the other members of Facebase, of the French Bank team, Dr. Francisco Anderson, Dr. Mimi Jones, Andan Barton, Steve Potter, um, who I know is the person who is responsible for working with synthesizing or making the library from the higher end, John Kerber, and Steve Potter, who is one of the facilities that has the raising capture microscope. Also, Francisco Rivera, who pretty much makes all the RNA. I'm glad to learn about that. We have Mal Lu, who's currently presenting a poster, and Vivian Tuti, who's working with Arm and Mark on the bioinformatic analysis of our data, and also the network analysis. We have Jeff, Josh and John, and Ping Zhang, who we can do the network analysis for now. Okay, thank you. Okay, what's the question? So, I don't know if you're going to do this, but what do you think the end of the time is going to be? So, how do you do that? Okay, I'll answer theory theoretically because this is fairly recent and we haven't tried doing the comparison of what we see here with what we see here. So, like I said, the advantage of the uh, transcriptome atlas approach, the laser capture, is that we get very deep sequencing. So pretty much we can tell that if something is not there, if we don't see it, it's probably not there. Whereas the whole point for um, single cell or the, the restriction on single cell is you're really only capturing like the most highly expressed transcripts. So, but if you get enough of them, then you can distinguish populations. So we will be comparing what we see in the single cell um, with what we see in the transcriptome. Also making bulk controls for the single cell libraries. So you have like a ballpark of what you should be seeing in them. But it's definitely like what's in the single cell is like a restricted range of what's going to be in the laser capture. Hmm. Yeah. And I think this droplet based approach is really critical too, because you really do need just like as many cells as you could probably um, realistically get. Like hundreds is better than a thousand, it's better than like scores. So I see you began to uh, look at some of these uh, nuclear bombs, right? Like the Chris Webb heterogeneous cells. Mm -hmm. Like you compare future and the lab, whether there is some difference in terms of, you know, because when you have a heterogeneous, you can just run into the model. Yeah, I wouldn't have a number, but I'm pretty sure it's close to like a hundred percent. So I for the coronal libraries, I was forced to take RNA from both sides because the suture is so small. And so I was paying attention to, you know, do I see fusion um, in these sutures? And we were, I was judging that by um, alkaline phosphorylase staining on like, so every 10th suture or every 10th section, we keep that on a separate slide. We stain the alkaline phosphatase so we can see what the, where the osteogenic fronts really are. And I think in almost most cases, at some point along the suture on either side of these twist mites, there was some degree of fusion. But that's like the alkaline phosphatase. It's not necessarily osteoid. So I don't know whether, you know, Going forward, those, those sutures may recover or they don't fuse fully. Because when you look at the literature, maybe you have like, say, six papers at you know, at old mice to see what percentage of fusion is being reported, it seems to go from 60 to 80% um, when people do, say, micro CT. So I was kind of, so it was fairly close to 100%, but that's again by alkaline phosphatase. 
Whereas you know, for the phenotype that is most for the hands, it's like fifty percent. Like fifty percent look normal, fifty percent look. You, know, you can tell that they have the hand hand phenotype, the twist one, but the sutures were fairly uniformly affected. So technically, how, how do you get the single cell sequencing to your genotype laser capture? No, no. On these bone plates, so how hard is it to when you're extracting cells actually from the bone matrix, or you're just taking the very bone way and differentiating? So the idea is we want the suture mesenchyme and the bones that would be up against the osteoid. Um, so we're doing what we normally do to make primary cell cultures, like primary osteoblast cultures. So they're seeking out sutures, um, basically digesting them in its collagenase dispase, um, basically until they fall apart. And then, like, so that's why we're doing this preliminary data to see you know, how effectively we recover all the cells you might expect to see. So we obviously we want to see micro mesenchyme cells. And we can sort of identify those by gene expression from the laser capture. And then you just make sure you, we just want to see that we get sort of differentiated osteoblasts, because that means we're up against the face of the bone. And, I, and then that's as far as we need to go. And like the heat map that I was showing you, like those osteoblasts were expressing you know, osteo, um, osteocalcin, IBSP, SPP1. So if they're expressing osteocalcin, then they're differentiated. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.